Okay. Um, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to the second uh, Cambridge Disaster Research Network seminar of term. Uh, today we're going to be talking about disasters and early warning systems. Um, and so we have three great panelists lined up um, and I'm hoping that we'll have a, a really interesting discussion about this um, as well. Um, and I should say that we've kind of broadened the definition of early warning systems, partly through my naivety and partly because of our, our broader interest uh, beyond the hazard in this kind of uh, disaster network. And so we're thinking about early warning systems, both as ways of conveying what might be about to happen in a potential hazard event, but also in terms of anticipatory action and understanding what might happen um, in a longer term sense and, and where we might expect disasters and how we can uh, start to approach that from a, the point of view of mitigation as well. Um, but I am not really the expert on this, and so I would like to um, start the panel today by introducing Dr. Mariana Budemir. Um, Mariana did her PhD on cascading hazards at the University of Southampton, and she's worked as a consultant for a wide range of international organisations, including the UN and the World Bank, um, before moving to practical action, where she now works as a senior disaster risk reduction advisor, focusing on resilience. Um, she's also a knowledge broker for the DFID and NERC funded um, Science for Humanitarian Emergencies and Resilience program, um, which I'm quite interested to ask you more about later as well, perhaps. Um, but anyway, and today she's going to tell us about some of the work she's been doing on early warning systems and their interaction with gender. So take it away, Mariana. Thank you, Camilla. And you'll see that. Okay, so um, really great to, to be here talking to you all about um, early warning systems. Um, like I said, Maria, my name is Mariana Budimir. I've been working at Practical Action for four and a half years and a specialty in early warning systems. Okay. okay, so what are early warning systems and why do we do them at practical action? So EWS, early warning systems, uh, they're an important element of disaster risk management. Um, they're part of um, the way that we manage disasters and reduce losses. They're really the, the opportunity to provide information before an event occurs and then be able to take action before that event happens. So for example, a flood or a landslide or something like that. It gives us the opportunity to save lives, save livelihoods, um, and take action to reduce the losses as a result of disasters. Um, the real thing is, is there's no really one size fits all, so they're kind of a, a variety of approaches, a variety of scales, complexities, et cetera. Um, so we'll get some interesting perspectives I think, from the other speakers as well later on. Um, so the different elements of an early warning system, this is just a diagram um, that we developed based on the World Meteorological Authority organizations um, definition of what an early warning system should comprise. Practical action works across all areas of this, so uh, providing this knowledge, monitoring and warning, dissemination, communication and response capability. There are four other um, overarching concepts which are explained there, and really the consideration of gender, marginalization, social inequality needs to be considered across the whole um, remit of an early warning system. It's not just about uh, one element of it, it needs to be considered across all areas. So, like I said, Practical Action has been working on early warning systems for uh, many, many years. Uh, and more recently, we've been looking into gender and marginalization um, as we realized quite a lot of the work that we were doing. There were some barriers and some specific needs that weren't being taken into consideration for early warning systems and were meaning that people were being left behind. So they need marginalized people, whether that's um, based on their gender or their age, their ethnicity, their ability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those things need to have special consideration to make sure that we're tailoring and designing an early warning system so that everyone is included in those aspects. So uh, locations, not well, everywhere has gender inequality, but um, in extreme gender inequality and social marginalization does increase people's vulnerability disasters. They vary from place to place, but um, there's always uh, an element there of the inequality affecting um, someone's vulnerability to a disaster. Um, traditional data collection techniques such as going out and doing surveys, focus group discussions and things like that 
Often those who are most marginalized are missing from those data collection techniques, um, whether that's by specifically excluding them from those activities based on um, their, their gender or um, their status in the community, or by um, a perceived uh, not being invited, not being uh, interested in their perspectives and things like that, or by trying to protect their identity because of um, social stigmatization. So often they're not present in the, the data that we're collecting to make decisions about how to build an early warning system, uh, what people need, um, and how to, to plan preparation and response activities. There you go. So um, inequality in people's economic capital, um, the access to technology, such as the digital divide, is often uh, driven by um, gender, by social inequality, by um, uh, people's capacity to, um, to spend money, um, social capital in terms of people's preferences for formal or informal networks and their ability to participate. Um, all of these aspects have an impact on people's ability to access information and also their understanding of risk and early warning information. So this can be people's uh, literacy levels, which is often um, in gender unequal situations. Uh, women and girls have lower literacy levels than men and boys. So, for example, if you send out a warning message uh, and it's in text-based formats, there is going to be a proportion of the population that won't be able to understand that information. Um, groups who have higher vulnerability often have different preferences or capacities to prepare and respond. And through our research, we're finding that often those who are more vulnerable uh, have a higher workload capacity or, or have a, a lower risk, risk threshold. So want to evacuate sooner um, and get out of that risky situation. Um, more so than others who might have a, um, easier coping strategies. Um, and participation, even if you get people participating in planning, preparedness activities, that does not necessarily translate into uh, influence or power over their own ability to make decisions. So even if, for example, you get um, women in a room to uh, plan things out. Sometimes they're not participating, and even if they do participate, their opinions and their suggestions are not um, counted as equal to the men in that room, as an example. Um, and people's capacity to respond, and when I say respond, I mean to an early warning message before the hazard occurs. So they receive an early warning message and they um, do something to reduce their risks, um, that capacity to respond is often socially driven. So whether they have support networks, whether they have the financial capital, whether they have the physical ability, restrictions on their mobility, et cetera, to actually take those actions. Um, and often those who are most marginalized require specialized and tailored support to enable them to take those actions. So what can we do? Um, it's complicated, but really the first step is really acknowledging that there is uh, a difference in people's um, capacities, um, their barriers, their opportunities to uh, interact with early warning systems. So we need to acknowledge their gendered impacts um, associated with early warning systems. And then we need to understand those differential impacts better. Um, and that goes beyond treating you know, women and when as uh, women and men as homogenous groups or kind of binary, um, uh, thinking about uh, men and women as binary um, groups and tailor the early warning system or design the early warning system for their specific needs. And just thinking about how those intersectional vulnerabilities exacerbate those gender um, vulnerabilities. So for example, um, a woman who is also uh, widowed and a single mum um, is going to have multiple layers of vulnerabilities that are going to affect their uh, ability to receive information, understand it, and take action on it in a, in a disaster situation. Um, and really to understand those 
uh, differential impact, we need to really seek out those perspectives and experiences and listen to them and then build trust and develop participation methods so they can feed into the early warning system planning and preparation process that means that they have the support to do that, but also protected um, their safety and their privacy. A bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the, the, the topics that we've been looking into on gender marginalization and early warning systems. Like I say, this is a, um, the last four or five years of practical action, we've been looking into this in particular. It's an evolving uh, conversation, and we're still learning more and more as, as we, we go along on this journey. So we look forward to uh, learning more and hopefully having a greater impact and really including and thinking about uh, and a transformative approach to including gender and marginalization, marginalized people in our early warning systems. Okay, thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, what a great introduction to the to the topic um, and uh, yeah, and uh, what we'll be what we'll be talking about. And I'm sure people will have lots of questions about the work that you've been doing as well. Um, so second, um, we'll move on to uh, Rachel Hunt. Uh, Rachel is a PhD student at UCL, funded by the London NERC DTP, um, and her thesis research appropriately looks at cross-cultural understandings of um, and responses to tsunami early warning systems in New Zealand, where she has just told me that she has not yet unfortunately been able to go, um, but that's the way of the world these days, isn't it? Um, so hopefully she's going to tell us something about what she has been able to do um, today. So yeah, Rachel, go ahead. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Perfect. Can you see that? Yeah, looks great. Okay, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rachel. Um, and as Camilla said, I'm a PhD student at UCL and my funding is provided by the London NERC DTP. I have supervisors in geography, science and technology studies and the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. And my PhD is looking into tsunami early warnings and responses in New Zealand with a particular focus on communication and public education. So um, just a little overview of my project. So individuals and communities are known to respond in different ways to official tsunami warnings and natural tsunami warning signs. So this research seeks to understand how official warnings are decided upon and communicated and the ways in which warnings can be tailored through education measures to improve tsunami awareness and preparedness. So I'm using online social research methods to collect documents and archives, as well as to conduct semi-structured interviews with tsunami researchers, warning specialists and emergency managers in New Zealand. And the interviews are then being transcribed in order, order that content analysis and thematic analysis can be carried out. So um, documents and archives are being studied to examine the nature and content of official tsunami information and the methods currently used to communicate these warnings. And to date, 97 documents and archives have been collected. And these can sort of be grouped into 19 different categories, including director's guidelines, memorandums of understanding, standard operating procedures, and ministerial reviews, like you can see there in figure two. And these, review, uh, these resources, sorry, have been provided by the interview participants. So a little bit more information about the interviews themselves. Um, I'm doing semi-structured interviews and recording them on Microsoft Teams, and they're being done with tsunami researchers, warning specialists, and emergency managers to gain an understanding of the opinions held on the effectiveness of official warnings and public education. And the participants are being recruited from research institutes, national agencies, and regional groups in New Zealand, Australia, the Pacific Islands, the UK, and the USA. Um, but the majority of the interviewees are from New Zealand, with 12 of the 16 regional areas being covered so far, as you can see there in figure three. So to date, 55 interviews have been carried out, and they range from about 20 to 70 minutes in duration, lasting about an average of 45 minutes. And I'm using a semi-structured interview schedule, which is made up of two main sections on tsunami warnings and tsunami preparedness. So... The interviews have been recorded so that they can be manually transcribed at a later date using Express Scribe software and the personal data of the interviewees is being anonymized for confidentiality purposes so names and identifying characteristics have been removed from the transcripts with the participants being grouped into regional locations like on the last slide and then types of organization that you can see there to make sure that they can't be identified. Um, and so far, 25 out of the 55 interviews have been transcribed so I've still got a lot to do there. Um, and then qualitative data analysis, such as content and thematic analysis, will be used to examine the documents and archives, as well as the interview transcripts in Envivo software. But so far, I've only had time to do preliminary content and 
systematic analysis, but already there's some themes that are emerging. Um, the three main themes are the responsibilities of national agencies and regional groups, the management of different tsunami source locations, as well as the use of sirens versus emergency mobile alerts or EMAs. So I'll just talk a little bit about each of those uh, main findings for you. So the first main theme is the responsibilities of the various research institutes, national agencies and regional groups that are involved in monitoring, disseminating and responding to official tsunami warnings. So GNS Science is the research institute responsible for monitoring tsunami hazards in New Zealand and data from the regional deep ocean assessment and reporting of tsunamis or DART boys. Um, data from that network covering the Hikarangi and Kermadec trenches is received by GNS Science and the data is then analysed to determine if a tsunami has been generated. And if tsunami generation is confirmed, then GNS will provide risk information to the nation's official tsunami warning agency. So NEMA, or the National Emergency Management Agency, is the agency responsible for issuing tsunami warnings in New Zealand. And NEMA communicates national tsunami warnings to regional response groups, as well as the public and media. And then the Civil Defence Emergency Management Groups, or CDEM groups, are then responsible for coordinating regional tsunami evacuations. So New Zealand is split into 16 uh, regional CDEM groups that you can see there in figure five. So in many countries, the same agency is responsible for both monitoring tsunami hazards and issuing tsunami warnings. But New Zealand having separate monitoring and warning agencies means there's a potential for error when passing information between organisations and delays can also be caused in disseminating official warnings. Legislative change would need to be put in place in order for GNS science to be responsible for both monitoring tsunami hazards and issuing tsunami warnings, and reviews of this have been carried out in recent years. And then the warnings are also communicated on a national scale whilst the responses carried out vary between regions. So having separate warning and evacuation agencies means that there is a need for consistent messages and coordinated responses. Um, and warning specialists on a national level and emergency managers on a regional level must work together in order to effectively disseminate and respond to official warnings. GNS is also capable of operating 24 hours per day, whereas NEMA and the CDEM groups don't have this capacity yet. And again, this can cause delays in issuing and responding to official warnings. But funding is being provided in the coming months to allow NEMA to operate 24 hours per day. But this funding isn't being extended to the CDEM groups, meaning that expansion is happening on a national level, but not a regional level. And then funding issues on a regional level also affect the number of staff and the amount of resources in particular areas. So that's definitely something that I want to look into further. Um, and then the second main theme is the management of different tsunami source locations with the capability to communicate official warnings for distal events, but a reliance on educating the public to observe natural warning signs for local events. So distally generated tsunamis can take over 12 hours to cross the Pacific Ocean and reach New Zealand, meaning that there would be time to disseminate uh, official warnings. And the Pacific Tsunami Warning Centre can also provide New Zealand with data from the Pacific network of dark boys in these situations. Regionally generated tsunamis represent the difficult middle ground. So in these circumstances, tsunami travel times are measured in hours, which may provide enough time to issue official warnings. And this will become more likely as New Zealand implements their new dark boy network. Whereas locally generated tsunamis can arrive at the New Zealand coastline within minutes. So the first confirmation of tsunami generation in these instances is likely to be when the waves pass coastal tide gauges, meaning that there would be no time for communicating official warnings. So instead, natural warning signs of approaching tsunamis must be observed and responded to. But that means that pre-existing public education must be in place to promote self-evacuation for when these natural warning signs are observed. So New Zealand is currently promoting the national long or strong get gone campaign, like you can see there in figure six. So this education campaign states that if a coastal earthquake lasts longer than a minute or the shaking makes it difficult to stand up, don't wait for an official warning, get further inland or go to high ground immediately. So those differences are another theme that I'd like to look at. And then the last main theme is the use of tsunami sirens versus emergency mobile alerts or EMAs. And tsunami sirens can be installed at strategic locations along at-risk coastlines and can be activated to sound different tones or pre-recorded messages. Whereas EMAs are a much newer system for tsunami warning in New Zealand, uh, the alert overrides the targeted mobile phone, sounds a loud and distinct tone, and then provides specific information and instructions on what to do during the emergency. Um, some regional civil defence groups discourage the use of tsunami sirens and are in the process of decommissioning any sirens that are currently in place. 
whereas other regional response groups still advocate their use. So Christchurch currently has a network of 45 tsunami sirens, like the ones you can see there in figure seven. The city is also securing funding to upgrade their existing system and to install additional sirens to ensure sufficient coverage along the coast. And although many emergency managers want to move away from the use of tsunami sirens, many local communities actually feel safer having a physical system in place. But this can often create a false sense of security as communities may not evacuate after observing natural warning signs, and instead they wait for an official warning that might not be issued in time. Tsunami sirens in New Zealand also need to meet new national standards as the different tones used are not currently consistent between regions. And they also need to make use of voice recordings to avoid warnings being misunderstood or mistaken for different hazards. And more information is provided in EMAs, meaning that confusion is less likely. Sirens can also continue to sound after the people at risk have been evacuated and these loud and repetitive sounds have been found to cause trauma in past events. And sirens also have a limited range. So you need quite a lot of sirens to effectively cover an area. Um, and this is especially true of windy regions such as Wellington where siren tones just can't be heard over the wind. And some people also consider siren towers to look ugly and spoil the beach, especially when you've got so many along the beach to cover a specific area of coastline. Um, EMAs can be issued to the areas covered by mobile phone masts. So geotargeting ensures that warnings are only sent to the areas that need them, which potentially provides more coverage than sirens. But EMAs can only be used in areas with good mobile phone coverage, whilst tsunami sirens can be useful in rural or isolated areas uh, with limited mobile phone reception. EMAs also require the public to own compatible mobile phones that are capable of receiving the warnings. And both sirens and EMAs require regular annual testing, like the advert there in figure eight, to check that the system is working and to make the public more familiar with the warnings. Um, Tsunami sirens can be expensive to install, whereas mobile phone masks are already in place, ready to be used for EMAs. And sirens um, are also expensive to maintain due to salt air damage and parts being stolen. And sirens and mobile phone masks can also be damaged by locally generated earthquakes, which would render them inoperable. Um, but sirens can be damaged by tsunamis due to, be due to being located close to the coast on low-lying ground, whereas mobile phone masks are likely to be located on higher ground, so that's not as much of an issue. And power to tsunami sirens and phone masks can also be cut lo during locally generated earthquakes. Um, many siren towers don't have battery backups, whereas mobile phone masks have multiple backups, meaning that EMAs can still be issued. So overall, these two methods of tsunami warning can be used holistically in a multi-channel approach in order to provide more uh, thorough warning communication. So those are the three main themes that I'm looking at at the minute. And overall, this research aims to improve the understanding of tsunami responses to official warnings and natural warning signs, as well as to strengthen the design of education materials for preparedness methods uh, contributing to the development of tsunami resilient communities in New Zealand. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, that was brilliant. Um, wow, this is super interesting. I'm learning loads already, so this is uh, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and so now we're gonna expand our definition sort of uh, beyond, I suppose, the, the individual hazard and start thinking about uh, a bit about how we might anticipate disasters more generally. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our final speaker, um, Beatrice Reaver. And so she did her undergrad here in, in Cambridge uh, in Middle Eastern studies. And then she's worked on humanitarian development and foreign policy issues in Europe and the Middle East at a variety of different organizations um, before taking up her current role as an analyst uh, at ACAPS uh, in a couple of years ago in September, 2019. Um, and her work at ACAPS focuses on anticipatory analysis. And so that's what she's gonna tell us about today. So over to you, Beatrice. Hello everyone, um, hope you can all see my screen. If not, please uh, let me know. <laughs> Very happy to be um, with you all and to hear from the other presenters. Um, very interesting inputs on early warning. So I'll try to connect uh, what's one of the things we do at ACAPS, which is scenario planning and humanitarian settings, um, both with the interest of um, the disaster research network, as well as the theme of today, which is uh, early warning systems. Um, okay. So as a first, uh, let's start from the basics. What is scenario planning? Um, 
So when we do a scenario planning, we start from the current situation and data available to depict a plausible picture of the future. Um, it is a bit of a mix of an out of the box thinking and brainstorming exercise along with um, including what we already know is quite likely or probable based on the data available. Uh, so we ask participants when we are building scenarios because it is a joint analysis exercise to um, kind of consider both kinds of uh, information they have. Um, there are many, many ways to build scenarios. Uh, the methodology we follow at ACAPS is mostly qualitative and is based on expert input. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of uh, four scenarios we came up with in our most recent report on Afghanistan, covering potential developments affecting humanitarian needs and access in the country between now and March 2023. So as you can see from here, among the key variables we consider for the scenarios were international engagement and also um, the kind of governance that was going to be uh, followed in the country and the one of the key goals of the scenario exercise is coming up with in this case four but it can be more scenarios that are plausible yes but also uh, quite different to explore the different impact they might have and the various combination of different events that could come up in the scenarios um, another question you might have uh, while you're listening is why do humanitarians use scenarios in the first place um, well, I don't want to hear my own answer, so I'll just use some of the information that um, scenario participants have provided, scenario readers have provided, and also the people that requested us to work on scenario building exercises um, highlighted. So some of um, the organizations have used scenarios for emergency preparedness and contingency planning. Uh, some others have asked for scenarios as they were planning for a multi-year country strategy. Um, some co directly connected to point number one on preparedness. It was also ensuring that prospective or ongoing programming was robust. Um, some humanitarians have, I, have used scenarios to reinforce advocacy uh, campaigns highlighting deteriorating crisis, um, to develop humanitarian access strategies if we have some practitioners focusing on that specifically. Um, but not just the report, also the workshops themselves can be a source of information and exchange between practitioners, for example, and give some ideas on um, how to move forward and potential developments in the country. So you might wonder how do scenarios connect to early warning? Because of course, when we talk about scenarios, we are very much into the, as we have said, preparedness and contingency planning side of things. Um, some scenarios are covering a period of one year, some two years, some even decades. Um, still scenarios can contribute to the identification of key triggers and dynamics uh, within a specific crisis that we are analyzing. Um, and if properly monitored and assessed through pre-established thresholds, uh, the triggers for a, for, a, for a crisis or for specific events that we identify in scenarios can be turned into indicators. And these indicators are samples for the direction the crisis is taking and uh, with additional research and the specification of thresholds that make sense for the specific organization that is using the scenario and where the programs are currently taking place, for example, um, and additional research are targeting on the shorter time frame, they could, they could also feed directly into um, risk analysis and so some uh, elements of early warning. Here we will see, especially on the side of uh, conflict, based on the example I will be presenting. So this is just to give you an idea. When we present a report, we have a final um, section, which is on potential uh, triggers for the different scenarios that we have analyzed, that the participants have, uh, have come up with. In this case, we have possible political and governance developments. So the idea is that the organizations reading or requesting the scenarios start from this table of triggers and adapt them as indicators to their specific situation or programs, and then also can um, can monitor and in that way they can bridge the sort of scenario and early warning um, part. So today we are talking about early warning system, but we are in the context of a disaster research network. So how have, what kind of role do disasters play in these scenarios? Um, how do the participants bring them up uh, in various scenarios? Um, 
well, we adopt a quite uh, broad uh, definition of disasters here. And so on the one hand, we, of course, as mentioned, um, often feature conflict, war and conflict dynamics and other security issues as um, key elements in the scenarios, um, as they are very difficult to predict and is one of the areas where expert input can really add an additional um, uh, element and depth to the analysis. Um, we use natural hazards uh, as key variables when uh, the current seasonal forecasts only cover a limited time frame. And so going in the longer term, it can be more, um, uh, the probability can be lower or can be less, uh, um, less defined. Um, we have also used sudden onset disasters as triggers for black swan scenarios and uh, as compounding factors for scenarios. So I'll just go quickly into the four examples of how we use different kinds of disasters in the scenarios, how they appear. So for the Afghanistan scenarios we've published at the beginning of the month, um, they were including conflict war and other security issues as um, key variables to consider going forward until March 2023 of what might happen in um, Afghanistan and what might be a key driver of humanitarian needs and potentially hinder humanitarian access. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the issue of having expert input on these difficult to predict um, issues and variables is what we kind to um, aim at in the scenarios. Um, in terms of natural hazards, um, when we have seasonal forecasts, which of course do not cover the whole period for which the scenarios were thought uh, for, um, we also consider um, different options and different climatic hazards uh, based on um, the knowledge of the participants and also previous trends in previous years. So for example, in the case of Central Sahel, uh, climatic hazards and natural hazards were deemed as one of the key variables to consider to build the scenarios by the participants for both Niger, for Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso. So in different scenarios, we um, included uh, the possibility of uh, having bushfires, prolonged drought and dry spells, riverine floods and flash floods in the Niger Delta as one of the key elements we were considering when building the scenarios and how that impacts humanitarian needs and access, of course. Um, then the third example is about uh, sudden onset disasters as triggers of black swan scenarios, in this case, a urban earthquake in the Afghanistan scenarios of 2019, um, and how the earthquake could affect uh, humanitarian needs, but also what happened if humanitarian um, assistance was slow to arrive. And then finally, um, for example, in these South Sudan scenarios from 2020, we have used sudden onset disasters as compounding factors for existing scenarios. So factors that could significantly change humanitarian situation, um, which we are not uh, considering in the scenario because whatever the scenario, they would have um, detrimental effect. In this case, it was um, flooding uh, directly connected to new water and um, her health needs, um, as well as livelihoods, threats to pastoralist communities in specific areas of South Sudan. Um, so these were the four examples. If you want to, just to, to give you an idea of the most recent work we have done, um, you can find other scenarios we've prepared in past years at the link um, in the presentation. I can also share it in the chat later. Um, and now since I've talked a little bit, I would like to hear from you. Uh, so I would like to know from you if you can think of any specific settings or situation in which scenario building in general, not specific to ACAPS, uh, would be fitting and how you would use it. Um, Camilla, I don't know if the link to the Mentimeter is already in the chat. I can't see that. Uh, yeah, I've just put it in the chat now, so people should be able to get there. Perfect. I'll try to share my audio and leave uh, three minutes to participants to reply to the question. Uh, thank you all, time's up. Uh, Okay, I see a lot of interesting uh, answers about cascading hazards and complex situations. Of course, of course, data poor regions, yes. Um, and 
complexity and also oh, interesting to have some specific regional examples. We will be looking into this one. Um, but yeah, you've given some very interesting answers and um, yeah, the essence of it is like the complexity and the um, sometimes lack of data and uh, playing on the strength of uh, participants' expertise, basically. So thank you for your inputs and over to Camilla. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to all our speakers. I'm going to stop the recording now.